lot of times people accuse me of talking too fast when I myself think I'm talking too slow. So I slow it down a lot from the way I would actually talk with uh, somebody else on another topic that uh, they may know a lot about. And uh, so sometimes I, I fail at that. And of course, I've got many countless videos on magnetism, but I've spent so many countless years thinking about this. And it's just such a, a simplex topic, and yet the explanation for same is not complex, but it requires a primer. And it was like, why are you so fascinated with magnetism? It's like, well, if you understand magnetism fully as the flip side of the coin of dielectricity, you understand both, you really can't understand 95% of nature. Everything becomes abundantly simple and easily explicable it becomes just very lucid like a, a single unworded you know moment of appreciation of a fine piece of art where no words have to pass through your mind and you don't have to think about it it just uh, becomes simplex beauty and of course fundamentally that's exactly how nature is Trying to explain magnetism, of course, I've given lectures. I flew out to Hayden, Idaho, to the Science and Energy Conference, and countless videos. And there's a bunch of fundamental misnomers, of course. And uh, the scientists, of course, love to talk about lines. And here you can see lines of a super powerful magnet. You see these cross-hatch lines that are actually intersecting at uh, inverse vortexes to one another. And this, of course, is the yin and the yang of the entire universe. Centrifugal divergence and centripetal convergence is the fight between the magnetic and the dielectric. And that's like talking about like the fight between ice and water. Ice and water, of course, are both water. One has a completely different attribute. One is, you know, liquid and squishy and wet, and the other one is a hard and uh, solid. And But they're both fundamentally the same thing. Human beings love to pigeonhole things something humans are really, really good at. You have all these so-called <laughs> brilliant scientists that are trying to come up with a GUT, or Grand Unified Theory. They're looking at electricity and magnetism, strong force, weak force, and uh, trying to unify something that, of course, is already completely unified. By saying they're trying to unify something means they're trying to reconcile their own ignorances in that and they keep looking at ice, as ice is one thing, water is another, and steam is another. In pure example, which of course is no different than fields. And if you actually understand these things, they become fundamentally simple. Here's a little chart that I created. Uh, makes it really, really simple. You talk about convergence, divergence, charge, discharge, centrifugal, centripetal, spatial, or counterspatial. If we're talking about something spatial, we're talking about the release of energy. The release of uh, force, we're talking about the creation of the toroidal field of magnetism. We're talking counterspatial, we're talking about, of course, the dissipation of that. And this same phenomena, without saying magnetic attraction, which is not magnetism at all, without saying gravity, is just one single expression. Increasing inertia and acceleration towards greater energy, i.e. the inverse of the dissipation of energy. Say some advanced alien species on another distant galaxy. They have one word, whether it be comp compound or not, who knows, to express that which human beings have talked about, magnetic attraction, gravity, which are not different things at all. They're the exact same thing. They have different attributional natures, but they're the exact same thing. So we're talking about charge and discharge. We're talking about charge. We're talking about uh, something that is dissipating Force is dissipating divergence, is dissipating a spatial vector towards the toroidal. So these things, even though this chart might look complicated, is extremely simplex. Charge is relational to dielectric, which equals spatial, which equals convergent, which equals centripetal. Centrifugal is equal to magnetism, which is equal to divergence, which is equal towards the creation of space, which is equal towards discharge. Yeah, like the release of a massive amount of energy from a uranium or plutonium core, which creates a mushroom cloud. If we actually eliminate out the stem of the mushroom cloud, 
Hot air rises. The only reason it has a stem is because hot air rises. Mushroom cloud is just a supergiant torus, perfect sphere of fissionable plutonium or uranium, creates an enormous torus. That's nothing other than an energy vector no different than magnetism, except of enormous amount of energy and of a different variety. But fundamentally, nature's force vector is toroidal. And why is it toroidal? Because everything like the dog on a leash that's staked in the middle of the backyard there, you know, it could run on the run on its leash here, there, and fro, but it's always staked at the center. The three-dimensional force vector of Mother Nature, which anybody can make if you can't visualize the three-dimensional force vector. You just take a piece of wire, you bend it like an S, and you take either end of that S, and you bend it inverse to one another. And that wire framework then extrapolates out the interior geometry of a torus. Very, very simple. Explaining magnetism becomes extremely simple too. Magnetism is the centrifugal force and motion vector of the release of energy. Because if, if you actually dissipate out the ambient um, energy of water, which is above its freezing point, right? Well, we're going to remove that energy. We're going to transmogrify it into something else. All of a sudden, we've got uh, water that isn't uh, wet and liquid, but uh, hard and cold but it's still water. The power in a magnet is not in the magnetic field. The power in every magnet on Earth is in the dielectric. And this is the reason why this super powerful magnet right here is an N52 Gauss. You can see the outside of the physical magnet right here. You see by the, how the huge, that big black spot is in the, in the middle there? Well, that's the dielectric. Everywhere we actually see light, we see constructive magnetism. Everywhere we see darkness, we see constructive dielectric. The cross hatches between the light and the dark is, of course, the magnetodielectric interplay. Yeah. The reason why that spot is so big on that enormous magnet is because the power in every magnet is not in magnetism. It's in the dielectric. What happens is, here's a little simple crude chart that I made. Here's an N35 gauss with an enormous magnetic field. These will be the cross-sectional lobes in yellow of the magnetic torus, the cross-section of a donut. You could take a donut and slice it like this, and you know, you'd be looking at the cross-section of the donut right there. N45 gauss, it's smaller. On the N52 or N55 gauss, the magnetic field is really small, but you actually see here in the white cones on these magnets right here, how small this vector here is, the acute vector on a not-so-powerful magnet. And it becomes less acute here, actually wider, a larger vortex on the pole of either side of the magnet. A magnet doesn't have poles, it has the inverse of counter space on either side. Huh? But human beings, they can't feel this. These white vectors right here are why magnets accelerate towards one another, but that's not magnetism, that's dielectricity. The stronger a magnet is, the smaller the spatial of the magnetic field is, because power in a magnet is not in the magnetic field, it's in the dielectric. Where you will feel it, however, for example, <laughs> is if you get two really powerful magnets close to each other, then this extremely unacute vector, uh, this wide uh, vector of the portal of the dielectric, will actually clamp together so tight they will break your fingers. People are fascinated by the yellow lobes over here, but that's not what defines a magnet. The magnet is the white conal vortexes on either side here, represented by these white vectors on the cross-section of the North and the South Pole of these three different magnets. What defines the definition of a magnet? That was kind of a redundant statement. I'll edit that out. What defines a magnet is not objective and substantial. It is not quantitative, it is qualitative. Before a magnet becomes a magnet, say this is a sphere magnet. Before a magnet becomes definitionally a magnet and has its all fancy phenomena around it, it is quantitatively 100% identical before as after. 
since it is, of course, qualitative, what is the qualitative nature that then defines that thing that we call a magnet? It is a point source object all of a sudden. Same distinction between a light bulb and a laser. These are constructive and destructive lines of interference. See, everybody's fascinated by the lobal magnetic field, which is ab extra to the magnet. Like, ooh, I can feel these two magnets pulling towards one another, which is not magnetism at all, rather dielectric acceleration. Or I can feel you know, them pushing apart if I have two light poles trying to face each other, which actually is magnetism in that case. Here we're actually looking, of course, at an hourglass, a sand and an hourglass. You can't take this analogy too far. But this is the actual engine of each and every magnet on Earth. And it's something that you never read in any book. Your teacher never taught you. And is the power and energy and capacitance of every magnet. And it is hyperboloidal, or hourglass shape. The inverse image of a torus, i.e. the geometry of magnetism, is hyperboloid. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, in the case of magnetism, the hourglass came first. The geometry of the hourglass, which is the dielectric. The magnetic field, of course, you have to imagine the lobal magnetic field of the cross-section of the torus on either side of this hourglass. Those, of course, are the vectors of force and motion, i.e. the vectors of the creation of space. This is the engine of every magnet, is the hyperboloidal geometry of increasing inertia and acceleration. Of course, an hourglass doesn't work like this. I'm only showing the hourglass because it has that geometric shape with the hyperboloid or the hourglass shape. But in the case of a true magnet, which gives it power, since a magnet is defined by its qualitative nature of being a point source, that point source would be right here, right at the middle of the hourglass, yeah? We used to use hourglasses, of course, and still do to measure time. We flip it over. It's a 30-minute hourglass or big fancy ones that are hour-minute hourglass. They actually measure out the sand, so it takes an hour for the sand to trickle from one side to the other. It takes an hour. But right here in the center, there is no time. There is no space. But here is where all the energy is. If you actually take two magnets and bring them together, you get one magnet, yeah? Then you have to talk about incommensurability, which takes hours. Magnetism and dielectricity are so simple, but if you have the primer in your head and you understand it, you don't have to use, make a thousands of videos and, you know, endless descriptors. Things become incredibly simple in a person's mind. But if you take two magnets and put them together, then it's creating one magnet. There is no magnetism right here along the center. There is zero magnetic flux. This is the plane of inertia. What's the easy way of describing the plane of inertia to someone? They will say, I love, they love this talking about the plane of inertia. It's the lowest pressure zone between the fight, between the magnetic and the dielectric. These so-called scientists, they love talking about lines of force. The only reason why they talk about lines of force is looking at constructive and destructive interference. You see where the light exists and the dark exists and all these cross hatches. Yep, that's the fight. You have one object with two expressions, the yin and the yang, which are both one. Ice and water are not two different things. They're both one thing. Magnetism and dielectricity are not two different things. They're one thing. But one has a completely different attributional nature. And human beings, likewise, in their grand ignorance, well, that's magnetism. Over here we have dielectricity. Yeah, ice and water, same thing. You know, we got different names for them because they have different uh, attributional natures. One's hardened you know, hard and cold, the other one's wet and soft, yeah. Same thing with magnetism and dielectric. This is the fight. The fight, of course, this is looking at one pole of the magnet right here. Yeah. The place where there's the lowest fighting going on between the magnetic and the dielectric, i.e. between centrifugal divergence and centripetal convergence, i.e. increasing inertia and acceleration right here to uh, the null point between the two where there is no magnetism, yet this is the highest energy point in any magnet if you draw a box around this hourglass shape and talk about the magnetic field and the dielectric field, of course, the hourglass, of course, is the dielectric geometry. The lowest fight zone, if you will, kind of like a neutral zone, right? Like Star Trek. Neutral zone is right here, as human beings love to call it, plane of inertia, right here. Yeah. 
You have centrifugal divergence here, centrifugal convergence here and here. And the place where there's the lowest pressure fighting going on, and I use fight in a very loose sense, it's not literally a fight. Between the yin and the yang fight, actually not a fight, is right here. And the same thing on this hourglass here. There's no magnetism, there's counter space, there's all energy, there's all potency. There's no polarity here, there's no magnetism here, there's absolute energy and capacitance here. Acceleration is a vector, but it's the vector of counter space. Force is a vector of what, as well. Here we have the uh, increasing uh, inertia and acceleration, excuse me, increasing force and motion of centrifugal divergence, which of course is also a vector. But that vector is directed at the creation of space. Space is a negative image of uh, this point right here. What is the absolute, just think about it a second, it'll become abundantly clear. What is the absolute negative of, inverse, opposite of pure potential, highest energy, no magnetism, no flux? What's the absolute inverse of that? Let's take like the softball sized lump of uranium or plutonium. Let's make that analogous to. Uh, the middle point of the of the hourglass here. What's the absolute opposite of that? In the mushroom cloud, right? Which is what? Force, motion, chaos, space. Creates an enormous spatial donut. Huge spatial donut. If the atmospheric conditions are perfect. The volume of that donut, of course, is space, which Nikola Tesla told you over and over and over again has no property. Space is not a thing. Space is the negative image of eternity. And by eternity, which I use loosely and make the metaphysical sense of eternity, is absolute pure potential. Right here is the closest analog we have to, inertia, um, to the ether. Pure potential. No flux. Highest energy density. No magnetism is present here. You can actually take two magnets, bring them together, thereby creating one magnet, stick a very super thin... A uh, Gauss meter probe, Gauss probe between the two, some of them are thin as paper. Yeah, Gauss probe, you'll observe no magnetic flux. Well, how's that possible? We brought two super powerful magnets together. We stuck a Gauss probe between the two. We brought them together by creating one magnet. Yeah, because when you brought the two together, you created not two magnets together, but just one magnet operating as a point source object. And right here, there's no magnetic flux. The opposite of this is space. Space is impotency. Space is no different than a shadow. What's the opposite of a shadow? Shadow is not a thing. Shadow is an absence of something. Space is not a thing. Space is the absence of pure potential of the ether, of counter space. You can say zero point energy. I don't care what you call it. Mother Nature doesn't care and you shouldn't care either. You should only care about the truth. Things become abundantly simple. Ask yourself the question, why is it the more powerful a magnet is, the smaller the spatial, smaller the volume of the toroidal uh, field of the magnetism actually is? Well, the answer is really simple. Because this right here is the engine of every magnet on Earth, not the toroidal field that surrounds it. That's what people think. This is all human beings do think. You talk about magnet, talk about magnetism. They talk about the toroidal field, which is ab extra to the magnet. There's all this magical stuff out here outside of the magnet. It's fascinating. You can feel stuff pulling. It'll pull metal to metal. And that's the only thing people think about. This, that toroidal field is not the engine of a magnet. This hyperboloidal or hourglass shape is the engine of every magnet. It is Occam's razor in absolute perfection. It is simplicity personified, actually objectified. Actually, we can't say objectified since we're talking about field. You got my point on that one. I hope I made this a little bit clearer and tried to make a different approach so, approach so that people would understand it. Let me know if you have any questions. I read every comment. Have a lovely day. Lux e veritas. Goodbye.